Hello and welcome to Africa Live, where we bring you African and global news from all perspectives. I'm Famila Mala. Now, also coming up in the next half hour. Nigerians in the north turn to artisanal mining to escape poverty. And World Cup hopes Cape Verde's disqualification reignites Tunisia's World Cup dream. We begin in Egypt, where authorities are citing a recent suicide bombing in the capital, Cairo, as one reason they've extended the country's state of emergency. It will now run for at least two more months. While well, as CCTV's Adil Marui reports, the move has prompted the mixed reactions among Egyptians. For decades under Hosni Mubarak, Egyptians lived under a state of emergency. It was widely detested then. Now, though, many people are reconsidering. I am sorry it comes to this, but we are facing extraordinary circumstances. We are obliged to do it. We are facing terrorism. The interim government imposed emergency law on August 14th as security forces cleared out camps holding supporters of ousted President Mohamed Morsi. It's extending the emergency state now because the military is fighting militants in Sinai, many of them sympathetic to Morsi. Just last week they tried to kill Egypt's interior minister in Cairo and they've promised more attacks. It will be extended for two, four or six months, but we are going round in circles. This solution must be lasting. I accept it, but what will happen afterwards? We need a parallel solution. Emergency law gives extra powers to security forces, including the right to arrest anyone without a court order. It's been used to detain thousands of Morsi supporters. By law, parliament must approve plans to call or extend the state of emergency. But parliament's been dissolved and parliamentary elections are not scheduled till next year. The two months extension is the maximum the government can go for now. By mid-November, if it still need emergency powers, it should first secure a popular mandate through a referendum. Adel Mahroui, CCTV, Cairo. Well, let's now get more on our top story. I'm joined by Bashir Abdel Fattah, a political analyst at the Al-Ahram organization, live from the Egyptian capital, Cairo. Welcome to Africa Live. Now, looking at this extended state of emergency, how successful is it likely to be in combating this uh, state of insecurity that Egypt is experiencing? Uh, we can say in the short run, uh, they might succeed to put uh, or to limit uh, the consequences of the of terrorism and the violence in Egypt but on the long run I don't think that it will be successful because after the parliamentary and the um, presidential and the con new constitution uh, you have uh, to impose some democratic uh, arrangements so I don't think that you can impose the uh, state of emergency again and you cannot uh, uh, be in a confrontation and uh, be in a war against terrorism after that through uh, the state of emergency so in the short run I think it might be successful but in the long run I don't think so because and also don't forget uh, the bad consequences of this state of emergency in the economy in Egypt and in the democracy in, in our country uh, so I, I think we need the uh, parallel with the security arrangements by the state of emergency we need a political treatment to violence and uh, um, and the terrorism in Egypt not only security affairs like the state of emergency now, Mr. Fatah, you just touched on the uh, implications for the economy as well as politically regarding the state of emergency. What are we looking at in terms of its impact on the economy, for instance? Are you able to hear him, Mr. Fatah? Uh, yeah, uh, I think there are bad... Yes, yes, I can hear you. Uh, I think there are many bad impacts and the consequences f uh, for the state of emergency on the economy in Egypt. First of all, terrorism. Terrorism has been deeply affected by the state of emergency. We don't have terrorists in Egypt and the terrorism now is blocked in our country. And you know uh, it, it participates in the economy uh, not, more, not less than 40% of the economy and the, the international income in Egypt. So terrorism has been deeply affected and also the uh, economy.
economic and the trade and the industrial affairs in Egypt also has been affected. And don't forget the time night curfew also affected the economy and trade in Egypt. So I think the, uh, cons the economic consequences and the bad economic impacts of the state of emergency is getting high and it affects Egypt in this uh, uh, transitional era so much. So I, I, uh, I thought that the authority will not extend the state of emergency because of its bad economic consequences in our country. All right, Mr. Fatah, we're going to have to leave it there. Thanks for your time this afternoon. We're speaking there to political analyst Bashir Abdel Fatah. Well, time now for a quick break when Africa Live returns. Member states join or leave um, the Rome studies based on their national uh, you know, uh, processes. Upping the ante, the African Union rallies behind Kenya's stance on the ICC membership. And pushing for a deal, the UN Security Council urges the speedy resolution to a DR Congo conflict. You have been charged with murder. How do you plead? Not guilty. We are receiving uh, some harsh criticisms. I therefore salute the Kenyan voters for rejecting that black man. And then saying that ICC is targeting Africa. Do not make it difficult for us. This week, Talk Africa delves into Africa's love-hate relationship with the International Criminal Court and poses the question, what next Africa? Welcome back to Africa Live. Now, the African Union's Deputy Chair, Erastus Wencher, exclusively told CCTV that the AU wants African states to dispense justice in their own institutions without the interference of the International Criminal Court. He's added that it also wants the ICC to respect that. Wencher also says the intention of states like Kenya to withdraw from the ICC is something that is decided by individual member states. But the AU strongly supports the idea that Kenya tries its leaders at home. In the case of Kenya, the Kenya government has repeatedly indicated that they are willing to look into the matter and use national processes. And, and, and so the African Union decision is in line with the Rome statutes themselves. Member states join or leave um, the Rome statutes based on their national uh, you know, uh, processes. Now, to discuss this ICC issue further, we're joined in studio by uh, Ambassador Boaz Mbaya, who is an international relations expert. Welcome to Africa Live. Thank you very much. Now, looking at this debate that continues raging and also the stance taken by the AU, what kind of impact would it have on the, the trials that are currently underway at the ICC? Uh, thank you. I don't think it is going to have an impact. The, the judicial process will continue. Uh, African Union is going to make political declarations political support for Kenya, for Kenyan president and deputy president, and uh, that, that's it. Uh, the other, otherwise, the judicial process will continue, yes. Now, there are also reports coming in that four other African countries have applied to be joined to the court as, as friends of the court. What do you make of this development? Well, it's good to know that there are African countries friendly to Kenya and who are willing to stick out their neck for, for Kenya. But as I said, this is a judicial process. It is, Kenya is not uh, 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 on trial in The Hague. It is three individuals, three Kenyans, who are on trial in The Hague. And if there is any support they can get from Africa, fine. Uh, but I don't think it is necessarily going to have any effect. No. What do you think has prompted this kind of application from those states with regard to Kenya's case? Well, there are concerns, and I think I agree with those concerns to a certain extent, that uh, Africa should be able to deal with these own problems without interference from outside. But the ICC has not interfered, say, in the Kenyan case. We took ourselves to the court. Uh, because we failed to, uh, to establish 
mechanisms that could deal with those issues in Kenya here. So whereas the support is welcome, I think you should let the judicial process take his, his own course. Now, Mr. Bayer, statements have been made. What do you think the likelihood is that these African states will follow through with these threats to withdraw from the ICC? And could it later impact on the validity of the ICC? It's very unlikely because AU makes political declarations. They make resolutions. And each individual nation will decide because of its own national interest whether to stay or not to stay as a, a party to the Rome Statute. And uh, that is not going to be because of the Kenyan case. I think they'll take the decisions based on what they think their country should follow. All right, uh, Ambassador Boaz Mbaya, thank you very much for your time and thank you for joining thank us you. at Africa Live. Thank you, thank you. Well, moving on, Ramatani Lamrara, the African Union Peace and Security Commissioner, has reportedly left to take up the post of Foreign Minister in his home country of Algeria. Lamamra had been serving a second term in office, but According to sources from within the AU, he'd been asked by the Algerian government to join its cabinet. Described as the right-hand man of current chairperson in Kosazana Dlamini Zuma and with a solid track record in his field, the Mamra's departure is likely to be felt. According to the AU's quota system, the Mamra's replacement is expected to come from North Africa. The UN Security Council on Thursday voiced concern over the security situation in the DRC. It's called on all parties in the Great Lakes region to fulfill their commitment to achieve lasting peace. In a statement, members of the council reiterated their support for the implementation of the commitments under the peace, security and cooperation framework for the DRC and the region. The M23 composed of soldiers who mutinied from the DRC National Army in April, along with other armed groups, has clashed repeatedly with the government troops in the past year. The fights displaced more than 100,000 people. This has only worsened the ongoing humanitarian crisis in the region, which includes almost 3 million internally displaced persons and over 6 million in need of food and emergency aid. The members of the Security Council reiterated their support for the implementation of the commitments under the Peace, Security and Cooperation Framework for the Democratic Republic of Congo and the region and call upon all signatories to fulfil their commitments in good faith, which is essential to achieving lasting peace and security in Eastern DRC and the Great now, a new UNICEF report examining trends in child mortality shows that if efforts aren't increased globally, the goal to cut the rate of children's preventable deaths by two-thirds by 2015 will not be met. However, there have been some successes in reaching this Millennium Development Goal. In Bangladesh, the mortality rate of children under the age of five decreased by 72% in the last 20 years. And in Ethiopia, a government program has helped the country reduced those deaths by a dramatic 67%. Over the last couple of months, thousands of families across South Sudan have been affected by torrential rains. Their homes and crops have been destroyed and some have fallen ill due to waterborne diseases or malaria passed on by mosquitoes which breed in stagnant waters. The United Nations mission in South Sudan is assisting local authorities in areas affected by widespread flooding and torrential rains. Around uh, 10,000 teachers face expulsion in a crackdown on illegal immigrants in Tanzania. The Tanzania Association of Managers and Owners of Non-Governmental Schools and Colleges says the crackdown would have serious repercussions on private English medium schools. The Association's Secretary General, Benjamin Nkonia, says most schools can't afford the $2,000 fee for a two-year work permit required for foreign teachers. Now, Zimbabwe's President Robert Mugabe has warned his new cabinet against sleeping on the job. He unveiled his new team of ministers earlier this week and says he expects them to perform. CCTV's Farai Mokotuya has more. I, Joyce, Swearing in Zimbabwe's new government. But there's little time for these ministers to celebrate. The president has promised to deliver jobs to Zimbabweans to improve basic services and to step up the drive to give black Zimbabweans ownership in formerly foreign-owned businesses. And Robert Mugabe is making clear he expects each minister to deliver on his promises. If, if the introvert 
goes to sleep, we get him awake. <laughs> if he continues to snore, well, we say, well, this is no snoring place. Uh -huh. And uh, we get someone who, uh, who can do the job. There had been speculation that Mugabe would appoint some ministers from the opposition movement for democratic change. However, he says the MDC's refusal to accept the election results ruled out any possibilities of them working together. The president and many of his allies remain under sanction from the West, but he says he will work around them. Yes, the sanctions can be a predicament, they can be an inhibition on us but uh, we, we will find our ways to make progress. And we have other friends who really would want to work with us. Among those friends is China, Zimbabwe's fastest growing trading partner. For now, it is up to these ministers to get the country moving forward. Farai Mwakutuya, CCTV, Harare, Zimbabwe. Now coming up in the latest biz news,